All right, before we even get up here to this infamous house and start this, I think we need to set this up in its proper context first. Because if we don't, this entire scenario is just going to seem completely out of place. Remember, the timeline that we're in now is 1981. And it's been 12 years since Charles Manson and his backup band set the Los Angeles area and the rest of the entire country for that matter onto its collective ear. During that time period, there were certain changes that were taking place in society here and elsewhere. And not all of them were necessarily great. One of the main things that we're talking about here is related to the consumption of and the business transactions connected to the use of illegal drugs. Now, before we get ourselves all bent out of shape about this, let me clarify. None of what I am about to say is meant to be any lesson of any kind on morality. It's not a judgment of what anyone might think about the recreational use of drugs, the medicinal uses, the legality of certain types of narcotics, addiction, whatever. I don't care. That's not what this is about. But here's a dose of reality. And you could fight me in the comments if you want. There are drugs, and then there are drugs. And what I mean by that is this. You can grow cannabis, weed, in your own backyard. In fact, you can even grow a very small amount of it on your own kitchen windowsill if you want, or anywhere else in your house with a simple grow light. There's personal, recreational use, and then there's another term that we'll just simply call commercial distribution. And all drugs are not created equal. You don't grow heroin or cocaine in your backyard or on your kitchen windowsill. These are in a much different category and the procurement of these substances happens in a much different and a more complicated manner. Almost always related to either organized crime or to a drug cartel located somewhere in South America. And traditionally speaking, these business entities are usually not known for their sense of humor or their commitment to friendly customer service. And now, related to the true story that we're about to tell, I do think that there is a lesson to be learned here. This is one about a group of people who got themselves in way over their heads and forgot that there is a big difference between your friendly neighborhood pot dealer and people with ties to much more dangerous organizations. So enough of that. I think we've probably set the stage here. And so let's just jump right into this. John Holmes. If you already know who that is, just saying that name alone already lets you know that we're about to get down and dirty and down into the skankier parts of the underbelly of a certain genre of the entertainment industry that began to legally flourish here in the mid-1970s. Yep, we're talking about the porn industry. And John Holmes was the undisputed king and the heavyweight champion of actors that were involved in the business of pornographic film. So, why? Well, was it because he was an incredibly talented and a trained Shakespearean actor? No. Was it because he was considered extremely handsome and charismatic? No again. Was it because he was just highly intellectual and got by on his wits alone? No. In fact, he was considered by everyone who knew him to be a complete numbskull. So, why was he so successful in his chosen field and profession? It's because he had a 14-inch penis. And not only was Mr. Holmes the owner of a lower appendage of unusual size, he also made a lot of money very quickly. And then he soon developed an unusually sized cocaine habit. 
So large a habit, in fact, that it was said that he was burning up to 90% of his entire income on purchases of cocaine alone. Cut. But as you can already imagine, this behavior was not conducive to his employment status because even in the world of pornographic entertainment, you still have to show up to work and you still have to perform on the job. By 1980, his massive drug habit had all but ruined his once promising career and the phone just stopped ringing. The steady work that he had become accustomed to, up to three films per day, had all but dried up. And when the career went into a nosedive, so did his income, but not his cocaine habit. So, what's a cokehead to do when the money runs out? Well, you do what all addicts do who aren't ready to get help and quit. You just start stealing shit. That's what brings us here, 8763 Wonderland Avenue, an address which will live in infamy. Now this was not John Holmes' residence, although he did spend quite a bit of time here during those years. So what the hell happened here? First off, what was this place? Basically, it was just a rented house that was being used by a group of about six or eight petty criminals, thugs, drug dealers, thieves, and their various associates who came to be known as the Wonderland Gang. The woman who was actually on the lease was named Joy Miller, and this is her. Her history is odd in that at one point she was actually living with her husband in Beverly Hills, and then for some unknown reason decided to immerse herself in the world of heroin culture. So she left that other life behind and opted for this one instead, and in the process, began allowing her home to be used as a base of operations for this startup crime syndicate and as a place where transactions would take place, stolen goods were stored, etc., and also more or less of a crash pad and an out of control party house from hell. The neighbors in this area hated this house and the people who came and went here at all hours of the day and night. Now this isn't just some idle fact, by the way and it comes back into play later in this story. These parties and all this chaos and mayhem would often spill out into the street here, and it became well known as a problem house for local police. Okay, so back to the protagonist of the story, John Holmes. As we said earlier, by the very early 80s, he was down on his luck in his film career, and he was now resorting to stealing pretty much anything he could get his hands on. And that included things that he would find over here. Drugs, cash, guns, whatever. It didn't take long for these folks to figure out that it was him doing it, and eventually he was confronted and he was threatened. That confrontation became much more serious, and they demanded that he either figure out a way to reimburse them for these stolen goods, or basically they would just kill him. So John, being the creative genius that he was, hatched a plan. A plan that he decided to then present to his co-workers in crime, and by the time we get to the end of this sordid tale, you will no doubt agree that this one has got to go down as possibly the stupidest plan ever concocted. And for the people who called this place home, well, they ended up paying the ultimate price for that unbelievably poorly thought out decision. And here it is. Holmes would take $400 in cash from them over to his dealer, who by the way, just lived a short 10 minute drive from here up towards Studio City in an area that's called the Donuts. And he would simply purchase a normal amount of his usual buy. And during that process, he had devised a plan to go to a very specific room and to a back door to the house and make sure that it was left unlocked. The purpose was for the other members of the Wonderland gang to return later and to rob the place. He even drew them a map and a floor plan 
and he gave them very specific instructions as to where all the valuables in the house were kept, including a safe with cash money and drugs. There were even some of the guns that he had stolen from here that had conveniently ended up over there. There was jewelry, etc. But here was the biggest problem with this already risky venture, and it's not clear whether they were even aware of this or not. But this was no ordinary neighborhood drug dealer. The man who they planned to rob was named Eddie Nash. Now that already sounds like a mob name. So this guy, Eddie Nash, here he is. His real name was Adel Garib Nasrallah. He was a Palestinian immigrant who came here to the United States in the 1950s. And this is the classic tale of the person who came over here with only $7 in their pocket. And then somehow, probably through a sheer force of will and a lot of raw brutality, managed to turn a simple hot dog stand into an empire of sleazy nightclubs located all over the Los Angeles area. Most of these just served as fronts for his cocaine and heroin distribution business. This guy was an animal. And if any of those locations proved to be unprofitable for him, he just simply had them burned down and collected the insurance money for the loss. Now, in order for him to continue these types of business-related decisions, he also had to develop a network of inside contacts within the LAPD and the Los Angeles City Fire Departments. You know, for arson and stuff. I've also seen enough Martin Scorsese movies starring Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, and Al Pacino to know that when a certain type of a business owner gets to this particular level within this parallel world, they also begin to feel the need to surround themselves with hired help to protect their assets, to protect their inventory of goods, even themselves. This is exactly who Eddie Nash was. And why this other group of petty criminals thought that robbing him was going to turn out well for them in the end just seems to defy all sense of logic. I almost think that Holmes may have even set them up for a dismal failure. And maybe he was completely aware of what the end results were going to be. So everything more or less went to plan. Well, almost everything, other than a few minor details that played out within the heat of the moment during the actual robbery phase. And at roughly eight o'clock in the morning on June 29th, 1981, four members of the Wonderland gang launched a home invasion of the Eddie Nash house. The occupants were caught unarmed and unaware, and thus they were quickly subdued. But at some point, this robbery plan started to go just a bit sideways. Rather than just taking all the stuff that they could carry and getting out as quickly as they possibly could, which would have been the smart thing to do, these guys decided to make this more of an opportunity to humiliate Mr. Nash. They roughed him up a bit. They even made him say prayers to a God that he probably didn't even believe in. Then, in a scuffle with some of the Nash employees, a gun went off and one of them was shot in the back, one of Nash's men. He wasn't killed, but he was definitely injured. In the end, the Wonderland gang managed to get into the safe. They took all the cash in the house. They took a gigantic supply of cocaine and heroin and many other items of value, and then they made the short drive right back here to Wonderland Avenue. At this point, the short-lived celebrations for their huge score began, and it was time to split up the loot. Estimates have it that all combined, they managed to get away with anywhere between about $50,000 and $100,000 worth of property from the Nash House. And that's in 1981 dollars. Today, that would be the equivalent of probably over half a million dollars. 
probably between $500,000 and $600,000 worth of Eddie Nash's stuff. And one very important thing to keep in mind, based on the kind of work that we know that Eddie Nash did, if he had that much cash and inventory in his house at that time, there's a really good chance that he was in the process of making payment to whoever it was who was supplying him with cocaine and heroin. Taking this man's cash and drugs very likely put him into real danger of being killed by his own suppliers. And he would have been keenly aware of that. Well, we are in the neighborhood at the north end of Laurel Canyon in an area called the Donnas, based on the names of the streets, and unfortunately have a little bit of bad news. What you're looking at up here is the place that used to be the Eddie Nash house. But as you can see, <laughs> they've torn the old place down and we got a new place coming up. So, Unfortunately, I was going to show you the Eddie Nash house, but uh, can't do it anymore. Well, I guess progress just marches on. So meanwhile, back at the Wonderland Ranch, John Holmes, who was already not in the other's good graces because of all the prior theft, was given a smaller cut of the take and then shown the door. They essentially reneged on whatever previous arrangement that they had had with him. He was given a small amount of cocaine and then a few pieces of Mr. Nash's jewelry, rings and watches, etc., which then he promptly placed upon himself and then resumed going about his normal business in all of the same places around Hollywood that he usually went to. Eddie Nash was not an idiot and he was understandably absolutely livid at what had been done to him. Nash wasn't wasting any time. He wanted his stuff back. And he wanted revenge. Bad. He immediately started putting two and two together and within just a few hours he already knew more or less that John Holmes had to have been involved in that hit. So he dispatched his henchmen to go out and find him to bring him back in order for them to have just a few words with him. Holmes was pretty easy to find in Hollywood. And yeah, he was wearing Eddie Nash's jewelry at the time that they found him. So they threw him in the trunk and they brought him back to face the wrath of the Nash as the man liked to refer to himself. He was brought inside, tied to a chair, beaten, threatened with not only his life, but also the lives of just about everyone else that he either cared about or that he was related to. His family, his mother, he even had a wife, by the way. They threatened her too. But probably most concerning of all was that they threatened to cut off his world famous appendage, which up to that point in his life was really about the only thing that he had ever been able to use to make an honest living. And of course, it all worked. He gave them all up. There is no honor among thieves. Plus, why would he have cared at all what happened to these people? All of this, by the way, is taking place less than about 12 hours after the initial robbery. Nash and his people acted quickly. At around 3 a.m. in the early morning hours of July 1st, 1981, an unknown number of hitmen, along with John Holmes, traveled here to this house. They parked out here somewhere on this narrow little street, and they walked up that side staircase right there on the side of the house. Now, Holmes either had a combination to that lock, or else he rang the buzzer and someone inside let him in. But somehow, he got access to the inside of that gate, and then he got in the door too. And at that point, whoever these people were who were with him, they entered that house. 
and they proceeded to unleash absolute barbaric hell on the occupants inside. They were armed with lead pipes, possibly baseball bats, hammers, other types of blunt objects, and they violently beat four people to death in such a vicious way that there is no doubt that it was meant to be a statement. Now, important point, five people were actually present in the house at that time. And here they are. Out of these five people, one of them miraculously survived. Her name is Susan Launius, and she is actually still alive to this very day. Rumor has it that she lives somewhere in the Los Angeles area. But because of the injuries that she received here on that night, she still lives with permanent brain damage and is even missing part of a hand. She was the wife of Ron Lanius, who was one of the murder victims. Now it's also worth noting that two of the men who were directly involved in the robbery of the Eddie Nash house were not present in this house at the time of the murders. They were elsewhere, although they were intended victims. Now I did mention earlier that this house was already well known and was very much hated by this entire neighborhood. So it should come as no surprise at all that not a single person within earshot of this house on that night called the police. Many were questioned, but almost all of them stated that yes, they heard screams, they heard crashing and all sorts of violence happening somewhere that seemed to be coming from this house. But to them, it was all just business as usual for this place. So, how was this crime scene discovered? Well, as I already mentioned, there was a single survivor. Sometime in the late afternoon on that same day, a delivery truck parked somewhere along this narrow little street. Not for this house, but for some other house that was close by. The driver got out and said that he heard someone moaning from the inside of 8763. That gate was still open, and so was the side door. So he went up to investigate. He took one step inside and saw what had transpired, and he immediately called the police. The description of this crime scene on the inside of this house, as described by those who responded here and witnessed it, said that it was like nothing they had ever seen in their entire careers. It was awful. I'm going to wrap this part of the story up now by just saying that no one was ever formally convicted of murder in this case. John Holmes was arrested. He was questioned. He was even charged with four counts of murder and stood trial. Eddie Nash was arrested, and he was even tried twice for his involvement and his obvious motives in this case. But he was never convicted for accessory to murder. 20 years later, he was convicted of drug trafficking, money laundering, and he even pled guilty to bribing a juror in the earlier trial in 1990. He spent a single year in jail, and then he died in 2014 of emphysema at the ripe old age of 85. John Holmes, on the other hand, spent a total of 110 days in jail on the charge of contempt of court for refusing to cooperate and testify against Eddie Nash. He knew that if he did, he was a dead man as would be the rest of his family. John Holmes died of AIDS-related complications in 1988. He was 43 years old. When this whole thing went down back in 1981, the initial reactions of the people 
that were living in this area must have been a combination of shock and horror, anger, dismay. I mean, this was Laurel Canyon, right? It's almost as if some sinister element had crept in here in the middle of the night and then they somehow ended up with this powder keg living right here amongst them. Now, loud parties are one thing, but violent mass murder is another. There's literally an elementary school just right down at the end of this road, less than 2,500 feet from where we're standing right now. I think people were just trying to wrap their heads around this one and make some kind of sense out of it all. I mean, this kind of thing just wasn't supposed to happen here. This place is not utopia and it never has been. It's not like this place has never seen its fair amount of crime. I mean, being right up next to one of the largest metropolitan areas on the face of the earth. In the ideal world, you know, the one that it would make sense that we would all much rather think that we lived in rather than the real one. Laurel Canyon had been thought of as the place where Joni Mitchell went out into the yard and picked flowers for the vase, while Graham Nash stayed inside to light the fire and then sit down at the piano and write beautiful, quaint little love songs to both Joni and to the place that they both called home. Laurel Canyon had been the place where no one locked their doors at night. And friends might just drop by every now and then to say hello maybe bring over a plate of marijuana brownies. It was edgy, but it was still mostly innocent. People weren't killing each other. Change is inevitable, but all of it isn't always welcome. And that's the part we resist the most. It's difficult. And then over time, sometimes memories get a little hazy, facts become distorted, or just forgotten altogether. As I've walked around here on almost every single street in this canyon throughout this whole summer, I've seen people out walking their dogs and more or less just kind of living their daily lives. And I've even had a few conversations with some of the residents in this area. And other than just the general complaints about traffic or the difficulties in finding a place to park, cost of living, it seems like most people here still consider this a great place to live. And I don't have any real reason to disagree. Hey, you're back. So are we. This is Billy again with Wolf River Music Television. <laughs>